here. Thank you for coming out to church tonight. I know we have some visitors, and uh, I appreciate you being here in the service. Hadn't the Lord been good to us again today? Amen. Blessed us and helped us. Now, I'll just warn you, <coughs> right there it is. I got this little cough, and uh, I'm not contagious. Don't have anything you have to worry about, but uh, I may have to cough just a little bit. And I'm going to I'm gonna go to the doctor. My doctor's been telling me, he said, now, you're overweight. That's what he said to me. And he said, so you've got, uh, you're having trouble with your acid reflex, reflux. And he said, if you lose some weight. So I got a friend who is so skinny, if the wind blows hard, he'll blow him over. And uh, he's, he's skinny as a rail, and he has acid reflux. So I'm taking him to the doctor with me. And I'm going to tell the doctor, I said, you don't know what you're talking about. But anyway, we'll, we'll see what happens, what the doctor said. But I just don't, <coughs> I don't want this to make you nervous. And if I, I'll ignore it if you will, okay? Genesis chapter 49, if you'll turn over there. I want to thank you for all your kindness. Thank you for the good meals I've been enjoying. I've been enjoying spending time with the preacher and with Brother Jeff. And it's good to see uh, Brother Tom Holt again, and Brother Tom Holt and my pastor have been friends for years and years, and my pastor thinks the world of Brother Tom, and I'm thankful for him and for his friendship, especially his friendship to my pastor, and I'm thankful for the folks that God gives you along the way to help you and encourage you in the things of the Lord. Now, Genesis 49 is one of my favorite passages in the Bible. I'm going to get me a little water here. It's one of my favorite passages in the Bible. I have preached from it many times, and I've preached a couple times from this chapter here in this church. But I want to deal with a passage here in Genesis 49 that we have not dealt with here in the church. And really what I'm going to do is I'm going to just sort of pick up where we left off last night. We were talking a little bit about the Holy Spirit. I want to deal with that a little bit more from a little bit different perspective. I'll remind you, the Bible said, Paul said to the Corinthian church, What know ye not? Your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God. You're not your own. You're bought with a price. Wherefore, glorify God in your body and your spirit, uh, which are God. So here's what I, I want you to, to remind you of, and that is that if you're saved, the Holy Spirit of God has taken up residence in you. You. you are the habitation of God. The Holy Spirit is in you. Somebody said, Christ in you, the hope of glory, and that Christ in the person of the Holy Ghost lives in us. And then the Bible tells us, be not drunk with wine when is excess, but be ye filled with the Spirit. And so there we're commanded to be filled with the Holy Ghost of God. We're not commanded to be indwelt because that happens automatically, but we are commanded to be filled with the Holy Spirit. So somewhere along the line, and I don't know where it happened or when it happened, but somewhere along the line, the church began to believe that they could operate without the work of the Holy Spirit of God. Somewhere along the line, Christians have gotten the idea that they can do the work of God in the power of the flesh and not in the power of the Holy Spirit. But I'm, I'm going to tell you, friend, without the Holy Spirit, we cannot accomplish anything that is of eternal value. So I want to talk to you about that a little bit tonight, and I want to deal with one of these boys in this chapter. Now, what will happen here is Jacob is getting ready to die, and so he's called all his sons in around his bed, and he's going to speak to them. He will, to some of them, he'll mention things that have already happened in their lives and then prophesy about what will happen in their lives. Then some of them, he'll talk just about things that are to come. He'll deal with these boys. There's a couple of things I like about this picture. I like the fact that when Jacob called these boys, they put aside whatever differences they had and gathered around their father's bed. I think in our families we could get along better if we'd humble ourselves and put aside some things that are not so important for the sake of things that are important. And then the second thing I like about it is when they gathered there, Jacob had something to say to them from God. And every father ought to have something from God to say to his children. 
My philosophy is not enough. My experience is not enough. My earthly wisdom is not enough. My children need something from God. And every father ought to walk with God close enough that he'd have something to give and impart to his children. So Jacob gathers them around. The Bible said in verse 1, And Jacob called unto his sons and said, Gather yourselves together, that I may tell you that which shall befall you in the last days. Gather yourselves together and hear, ye sons of Jacob, and hearken unto Israel your father. Then what he'll do, we won't read all these verses, <coughs> Jacob will go down through the boys. He'll start with Reuben, the eldest, and talk about him. Then Simeon and Levi, and then he'll deal with Judah. And then he takes two of the boys and gets them out of order. And I believe there's a spiritual reason for that. He'll speak of Zebulun, and then he'll speak of Issachar. And then I want you to notice this boy. This is the boy I'm interested in. Verse number 16, Genesis 49, verse 16. Remember now, Jacob is prophesying about what's going to happen with these boys. Watch what he says, Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path that biteth the horse heels so that his rider shall fall backward. And then I want you to notice verse 18. And many, many Bible commentaries and men that are smarter than I am say that verse 18 is a parenthetic expression. They say that when Jacob said verse 18, he wasn't referring to what was going on. It's like he took a breath, but I don't believe that. I believe he's still talking to Dan. Now let's start again in verse 16. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path that biteth the horse heels, so so that his rider shall fall backward. Then Jacob says, I have waited for thy salvation, O Lord. I want to use these three verses and a couple more from the book of Deuteronomy. And I want to talk to you tonight. I'm going to call it Dangerous Dan. I want to talk to you about Dangerous Dan tonight. Now let's pray and ask the Lord to help us. Father, we're greatly <laughs> <clears throat> greatly in need of thee tonight, physically, spiritually, mentally, in every way. Lord, we need your touch and we need your help. So I pray that you'll help us. I pray, Lord, that you will glorify yourself. I pray tonight if there's someone lost without God, you might draw them to the cross. They might be saved. I pray for every child of God tonight that we might learn the importance of operating in the power of the Holy Spirit. Help us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, here is Dan. Jacob is going to speak about Dan, and I would like to submit to you that Dan is the most dangerous man among the sons of Israel. And the tribe of Dan will be the most dangerous tribe among the tribes of Israel. You say, preacher, why is Dan so dangerous? Dan is dangerous because the tribe of Dan is the tribe that first introduced organized idolatry among the Israelites. They've had trouble along the way with idolatry here and there. But when Dan takes up in the promised land, takes up, he doesn't get the portion that he's supposed to take it's too difficult for him or at least he thinks it is and so he takes another portion and while he's taking that portion along the way some spies come and they find a man who is worshiping idols and they take the idol and they take it to their city and they start this organized idolatry later on when Solomon's sons uh, Solomon dies and there's Rehoboam and Jeroboam the two boys and Jeroboam uh, splits Israel and he starts, he sets up two golden calves and one of those golden calves he sets up in the tribe of Dan, the city of Dan. And so what we have is idolatry. It's, it's in its form. It is, it is idolatry that is, um, how can I put it, formalized. It, it is not just here and there. It is established and Dan is the one that established idolatry in Israel. So so 
he is a man of danger. He is a dangerous man. I want to tell you something, friend. Idolatry is a dangerous thing. It is a dangerous thing for the child of God. The Bible tells us, keep yourselves from idols. But Dan and the tribe of Dan are introducing idolatry into the nation of Israel. Now, Dan is a dangerous man, and we're going to read about it in this passage. But what I'm wondering about, Dan is dangerous among these people, but let me ask you a question tonight. If I were to ask you this about the house of God, if I were to ask you this about Hope Baptist Church, if I were to say this to you or ask you this question, who is the most dangerous person in Hope Baptist Church? I wonder what your answer would be. I wonder what you would consider to be dangerous here in this local church. Well, I want to answer that question from this text. And I want to say three things to you about Dan and talk to you about the Holy Spirit. The first thing I want you to notice about Dan is Dan is not dangerous because of being false. Now, let me explain that. Here's what we might be tempted to think that the most dangerous person in the church is someone in the church who is unsaved. Now listen to me carefully. If you are not saved tonight, you are a danger to yourself. If you've never been born again tonight, if you've never repented of your sin and believed on the Lord Jesus Christ, you are a danger to yourself because if you die in that condition, you'll spend eternity in hell but you're not the most dangerous person involved in this work. I want you to notice something about Dan. Now watch our, watch our text here. The Bible said in verse 16, Jacob looking at Dan, he said, Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. Now that last little phrase is very important because Dan no doubt remembers and has been taught about Abraham. Do you remember that Abraham was married? It was Abram was his name. He was married to Sarai and Sarai was barren. She could have no children. And so what did Sarai do? One day she said to Abram, behold, the Lord hath restrained me from bearing. Go in unto my handmaid that I might obtain children by her. And so Abram went into Hagar, the handmaid, and a child was born. You remember his name? Ishmael. We're still feeling the ramifications of that decision. The Bible said of Ishmael, his hand will be, he'll be a wild man, his hand against every man's hand. That's the Arabian people that we're seeing in the Middle East, the sons, descendants of Ishmael, wild men, their hand against every man's hand. And so Ishmael is born. Now, later on, there will be the promised son. Isaac will be born. Remember that? God promised him a son. God gave him a son in their old age. The Bible said, Abraham considered not his body now dead, even the deadness of Sarah's womb. And so Abraham is unable to father a child, and Sarah is unable to, uh, to uh, conceive and have a child. But God works a miracle and gives them a promised son, Isaac. Well, can I throw something in here? It's not in the message. I won't charge you any extra for it. One day, Abram said to God, Lord, what, Lord God, what wilt thou give me? See, and I go childless. And he said, my, my heir is one born in my house, talking about Eliezer. And the Lord took him forth and showed him the stars of the heaven. He said, this shall not be thine heir, but one that cometh forth from thine own bowels shall be thine heir. He promised him a son. And when God promised Abraham a son, Abram believed. The Bible said, and Abram believed in the Lord, and it was counted unto him for righteousness. Paul said in Romans chapter 4 what shall we say then that Abraham our father as pertaining the flesh hath found for if Abraham were justified by works he hath whereof to glory but not before God but what saith the scripture Abraham believed God and it was counted unto him for righteousness how did Abraham become righteous he believed God what God said about a promised son Isaac you know how I became righteous the same way I believed what God said about another promised son his name is Jesus and the Bible said uh, he that heareth my word and believeth on him that sent me hath everlasting life and shall not come into condemnation but is passed from death unto life I am righteous in the sight of God tonight because I believe the record of his son and if you want to be right with God Jesus is your only hope 
He said, uh, he said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father but by me. Peter said, neither is there salvation of any other, for there's none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It's only through Jesus and Jesus alone that you can get to heaven. But I'm glad you can get there through him. Amen. So now, wait a minute. Let's go back to where we were. If we can come back here, put her in reverse a little. So here is... Dan, and he's standing there. Now, I want to say this to you. Dan has the wrong mother. Because you remember, Jacob had two wives. I'm not saying it's right, just saying that's the way it was. He married sisters. And when one of those sisters could not have children, she said the same thing to Jacob that Sarah said to Abram. Go into my handmaid that I might obtain children by her. And that's where Dan came from. He's a son of one of the handmaids. Now, here's the problem. When Abraham had a son, Abram had a son by the handmaid, there came a day when Abram cast that son out. So I want you to think about Dan. Here he is standing there. He knows what happened to Ishmael. He knows Ishmael was born of a handmaid. He knows he's born of a handmaid. wonder if Dan's sitting there thinking, I wonder if I'll be cast out like Ishmael was cast out. See, Dan has a problem. He has the wrong mother. Could I put it this way? He's got the wrong birth. Got the wrong birth. But he has another problem. He has the wrong behavior. Because there's only one thing. The very, the very first thing we really read about, about Dan after his birth is in Genesis chapter 37. And here's what the Bible said. Genesis 37 and verse 2. These are the generations of Jacob. Joseph, being 17 years old, was feeding the flock with his brethren. And the lad was with the sons of Bilhah and with the sons of Zilpah, his father's wives. Those are those two handmaids. And Joseph brought unto his father their what? Evil report. They were out there involved in wickedness. And Joseph, which was his job to do, came home and told about it. Now, here's the thing. Stay with me now. Here's the thing. We're going somewhere. Here is, here is this man, Dan. Jacob has gone through these boys of his first wife, Leah, and now he's come to the sons of the handmaid, and he looks at Dan, and he doesn't say to Dan, you know what, Dan? You're the son of a handmaid. You're not really my son. I'm going to cast you out just like, uh, just like uh, Abram cast out Ishmael. He does not say that. Even though he has the wrong birth, even though he has the wrong behavior, he's not living right. Here's what the Bible said. Dan shall judge his people as one of the tribes of Israel. It may seem that Dan would look false, but Dan is not false. His father, his father just proclaimed him to be his son and one of the tribes of Israel. You know what? That's exactly what happened to me. I had the wrong birth. I had the wrong behavior, but because I trusted Jesus, my heavenly father proclaimed me to be righteous and declared me righteous and I'm accepted in the beloved. Dan is not false. He's not a fake. He's not somebody who's not part. His father who has the last word has declared him to be part of the family. So he's not dangerous because of being false. All right, here's the second thing. Look in verse 17. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path that biteth the horse heels so that his rider shall fall backwards. Here's the second thing we're going to learn about Dan. Dan is not false. He's part of the family. And Dan is not a failure. Because sometimes we look at folks who just, they just seem like they struggle. Sometimes we're that way ourselves. And it seems like there's more failure than there is victory. And we would say to ourselves, that's the most dangerous person in the church. It's a person who tries and fails. But Dan is not a failure. Now watch what it said again in verse 17. It says three things about Dan. There are three shalls in this verse. Dan shall, or in, in verses 16 and 17. The first one in verse 16 is Dan shall judge his people. Here's Dan's mission. What is Dan's mission? He's going to be a judge. Now, a judge in the Bible does not always mean what we think of as a judge. We think of a judge who sits behind the desk and has the gavel and makes the decision. But a judge often in the Bible was a deliverer. 
He was a warrior. The book of Judges. He was a warrior. He was one to strive or contend. And so the Bible says what Dan is going to do is he's going to strive and contend. He's going to judge his people, his tribe. He's going to be a man of war. Now watch the second thing. Watch his method. What kind of warfare shall he fight? Here's the second shall. Dan shall be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path. So here's what we're finding out about Dan. When he fights, he doesn't try and overwhelm you with strength. He sneaks up on you. He uses strategy. He lays a trap and an ambush for you. That's the way Dan fights. That's his method. But then watch his mastery. Watch it now. Dan shall <coughs> be a serpent by the way, an adder in the path that biteth the horse heels. Now watch this. So that his rider shall fall backward. Now what's he talking about? Here's what he's talking about. In Dan's day, the war machine of an army was the horse. So he's not talking about a rider that's out for a Sunday afternoon ride. He's not talking about somebody out for a pleasure ride. He's talking about an invading army. And here's what he said Dan's going to do. Dan's going to lay an ambushment for that invading army. And when that invading army comes, they're going to bite the horse's heel. It's a figure of speech. And then he said that horse will fall backwards. So what he's saying is Dan's going to have victory. He's going to win. He is not going to be a failure. So here's the second thing I want you to see. You say, preacher, I'll tell you who's dangerous in the church. It's those that are false. No, that wasn't what made Dan dangerous. Well, it's those that are failures. It's those who never seem to make the grade. It's those that seem to always struggle. No, no, Dan. Dan is not dangerous because he's a failure. He's not a failure. He has mastery. So here's the question. What makes him so dangerous in the church or in the people of God? And what, what makes a person dangerous to the house of God? Now look at the next verse. Jacob has been talking about Dan. But in verse 18, he doesn't say a word about Dan. He talks about the Lord. He just talked about Dan winning the battle. But in verse 18, he says this, I have waited for thy salvation. Salvation, we preach salvation. We talk about salvation. The Bible has a lot to say about salvation, but it doesn't always mean eternal salvation. Sometimes it means deliverance. Sometimes it means victory. So Jacob had just got done talking about Dan's victory and Dan's deliverance, but he said, that ain't what I'm waiting for. He said, I'm waiting for the deliverance of the Lord. Now, here's what I believe he's, and I'll show it to you in just a moment. I believe what he's saying is, Dan, you've made an awful mistake. And here's your mistake, Dan. You are part of the family and you are an excellent warrior, but you are fighting in the power of the flesh and not trusting in the power of God. You know who the most dangerous person in the church is? The most dangerous person in the church is the person walking after the flesh and not after the Spirit. It's the Sunday school teacher who's teaching in the power of their wisdom and not the power of the Holy Ghost. It's the preacher who's preaching because he has a good memory and because he has a good delivery and he's trusting in his practice and trusting in his preparation, but he's not preaching in the power of the Holy Spirit. It's the singer who has an excellent voice and great ability and great talent or the musician that can make the strings sing, but they're doing it in their own power and not in the power of the Holy Spirit. Let me ask you a question. What is the difference tonight between a singer who stands on the platform at the church and sings at after the power of their flesh and somebody who stands in an auditorium somewhere else and sings a worldly song in that same power because of their ability and their talent. What is the difference between a speaker who gets up out on a soapbox somewhere and he has the right gestures and he knows how to use the right words and he knows how to gather in a crowd and knows how to influence that crowd? What's the difference between that and a preacher who stands behind the pulpit without the Spirit of God, not filled with the Holy Ghost, not operating in the power of the Holy Ghost and he's doing the same thing drawing the people in because he knows how to speak he knows when to get loud when to get soft how to move he is dangerous because he's not serving God he's dangerous because he's in the power of the flesh 
Dan has allowed, apparently, I think Jacob is telling us, Dan has allowed cunning. He has allowed his subtlety. He has allowed his, his uh, talent in war <laughs> to become the, the force behind what he does. And he's forgotten about his need for the Holy Spirit and his need of God. Paul said in Philippians, for we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. The flesh doesn't accomplish anything for the glory of God, but things done in the power of the Holy Spirit, a life submitted and surrendered and subject to the rulership and lordship of the Holy Spirit can accomplish something of eternal value. Now you say, preacher, I think you're stretching this. Well, let's see a moment. I want you to, I want you to look with me in the book of Deuteronomy. And I want, I want you to think about Dan. His mistake is he's trusting himself. But I want us to see something that Moses will say about the tribe of Dan. I want you to see something about Dan's maturity. When Moses does the same thing that Jacob does in Genesis 49... He, J- Jacob will deal with the boys individually. Moses will deal with the tribes. When he comes to the tribe of Dan in Deuteronomy chapter 33 and verse 22, here's what he says. Now watch it. And of Dan, he said, Dan is a lion's whelp. A lion's whelp. What is a lion's whelp? That's the baby lion. Dan is a lion's whelp. Now, you probably, I should have told you, but go back to Genesis 49 a moment. I want to read you what the Bible says when Jacob talks about his son Judah. And in Genesis 49, Jacob says in verse 9, Judah is a lion's whelp, but that's not all he says. From the prey, my son, thou art gone up. He stooped down, he couched as a lion. And as an old lion, who shall rouse him up? So when Jacob talks about Judah, he said Judah is like three lions. He's the baby lion. He's been the baby. He's the adult lion that takes the prey. And he's the old lion that you just better not mess with. He tells us Judah's all three of them. But how many lions was Dan? Just one. Stay with me now. We're headed somewhere. He said, Dan is a lion's whelp, a lion's whelp. You know what he's saying? Dan never grown up. Dan's never grown up. Dan's still a baby. Dan's still a baby Christian. Dan is the kind of Christian who doesn't walk. He's a picture of the kind of Christian who doesn't walk after the Spirit. He walks after the flesh. And so you know what? He is easily disturbed. He's easily upset if he doesn't get his way. If you don't like, if you you try and correct him, he's going to be upset. If you say to him, you know, we're going to make a change, he's going to say, no, we've been doing it this way so long, we're not changing. He is easily upset because he's a baby. He's a child. Children get upset easy, don't they? Things that don't upset grown people upset children. They upset them. And when a person is in the church and everything upsets him, everything gets him off kilter, everything makes him angry, he's critical of everything. You can't change anything. You can't start anything. You can't stop anything because he'll get upset if you change. That's what happens with children when you change their structure. So we're not going to do it like that this time. And, And that child will throw a fit. I've seen grown people in the house of God throw a fit. They were grown on the outside, but on the inside they were a whelp, a baby. Now watch what else he said. We're still in Deuteronomy. Dan, he said, Dan is a lion's whelp. Then he said this, he shall leap from Bashan. Bashan's an interesting word in our Bible because it is associated with a man of great physical strength. Og, Sihon and Og, the two kings, and one of them was, maybe both of them, but at least one of them was a giant. And when the psalmist writes about Jesus on the cross and the strength of the Roman army around him, he said he was surrounded, uh, encompassed by the bulls of Bashan. Bashan always in our Bible represents human strength, physical strength. And where is Dan leaping from? Physical strength. What is behind what Dan does? Physical things, natural things, not spiritual things. Dan is dangerous Because everything about him is fleshly. 
and nothing about him is spiritual. I'll tell you a story. I was preaching in a girl's home down in Mississippi, and it was a small, the auditorium, auditorium where it was very small, it was, it might not even been as big as this platform. And I was preaching, and another man, if I were to name him, everyone, everyone in our Baptist circles would know who he was. He was preaching with me. He's my hero. And so one night I was to preach, then he was going to preach, and I took some extra clothes with me. I was going to change my clothes afterward. We were going to play some games with the girls in the home. These, this was a home for troubled girls. And so I'm carrying, it's before the service, and I'm carrying my clothes. And I'm, I'm walking down, I'm going to walk past the auditorium, and there's a schoolroom, and I'm going to hang my clothes in the schoolroom. And there was one bathroom there on the other side of the hall. And so I'm walking toward there with my clothes in my hand, and I hear moaning in the bathroom and groaning. And my first thought was, one of those girls is in trouble. These were troubled girls. I, I thought one of these girls is in trouble in that bathroom. So I stopped, and I kind of leaned my ear toward the door, and as I leaned my ear toward the door, I could, I could tell a couple of things. I could tell, first of all, it wasn't a girl. It was a man. I heard him moan, and I could tell by how muffled it was that he was on the floor. And so I stood there and listened. And here's what I heard. Oh, God. Mm-hmm. Oh, God. Oh, God, I have to preach. Oh, God, I'm going to get in the pulpit. Oh, God, I have to preach the gospel. Oh, God, don't let me get in the pulpit by myself. Oh, God, don't let me preach in my own strength. Oh, God, don't let me strengthen preach in my own power. Oh, God, help me. Oh, he's moaning and crying out to God like it was the first time he'd ever preached. He'd preached thousands of times in hundreds of different places. And he's on the floor in the bathroom getting ready to preach to 18 girls and myself and the director. And he's not saying, you know, I I can handle this. Just a few girls, just a couple of people. He's on the floor begging God to help him because he understood he couldn't get the job done without the Holy Spirit and the power of God. I'll tell you when we become dangerous. We become dangerous when as a Christian we think somehow we can get along without being full of the Holy Spirit, without being yielded unto God. When we're polished and prepared and programmed and we know how to get through the thing, we become dangerous because we're operating without the God that saved us and the God that called us, and the God that put us in the work. Now, I want to show you one more thing about Dan. I want to show you Dan's mention. Look in the book of Revelation chapter 7. Revelation chapter 7, and I want you to notice this. We could spend some time in Revelation 7 talking about the import of this passage and the context of it, but I just, wanted, I just want you to notice one thing. In Revelation 7 and verse 1, the Bible said, After these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow on the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. And I saw another angel ascending from the east, having the seal of the living God, and he cried with a loud voice to the four angels to whom it was given to hurt the earth and the sea. And he said, Hurt not the earth, neither the sea nor the trees, till we have sealed the servants of our God in their forehead. So what are they doing? Sealing the servants of God. Then he tells us who they are, starting in verse 4. And I heard the number of them which were sealed, and that were sealed in 140, and 4,000 of all the tribes of the children of Israel, the tribe of Judah, were sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Reuben, were sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Gad, were sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Asher, were sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Naphtalim, were sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Manasseh, were sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Samson, or excuse me, Simeon, <coughs> were sealed 
12,000 of the tribe of Levi were sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Issachar were sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Zebulun were sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Joseph were sealed 12,000 of the tribe of Benjamin were sealed 12,000 Did you notice Dan is missing His name is not mentioned in the passage The only conclusion I can come up with is Dan is not a servant of God. He's a servant of himself. And so he's not listed amongst the servants of the Lord. When I was a young man in school, I played football in the fall. I wrestled in the winter, and I was on the track team in the spring. The reason I did that is because I couldn't throw, I couldn't hit, and I couldn't catch, and I couldn't shoot. But I could run fast and I could knock people down. So I played football. I was a lineman. And then I was on the wrestling team and then I ran track. And I, I, ran, I ran the 220 yard dash. They call it the 200 meters now, but I'm an American and I refuse to convert. Amen. And I ran the 880 relay and I ran the 440 relay. I think I mentioned that to you. And then I, I ran the 180 low hurdles. My coach tried to get me to run the 120 high hurdles, but I had some kind of mental block, and I couldn't get over that thing. But I could run the low hurdles. And I remember one time we were playing our, we were in a track meet against our arch rival, Thornapple Kellogg High School, Middleville High School. And we were in the 180 low hurdles, and I won the race. I came in, I came in ahead of everybody. But when they announced the winner, they did not announce my name. They announced the one that came in second. And the coach came and he took me by the arm and he said, you got disqualified. I said, disqualified? He said, on one of those hurdles, you brought your leg around instead of straight over. And you were disqualified. I thought I had won. I was already celebrating because I'd won. But I hadn't done it the way it's supposed to be done. And I didn't win the prize. I want to remind you tonight that if we're going to win the prize when we stand before the Lord, we'll have to do the work of God the way He said to do it. We'll have to do it in the power of the Holy Spirit and not after the power of the flesh. We'll have to be yielded unto God and be filled with the Holy Spirit and do the work that we're supposed to do in the power of God and not after the power of man. And if we don't do that, if everything we do is because we have some talent or some ability or some gift that somebody else doesn't have, when we stand before God, it won't mean a thing, not one thing. When I stand before the Lord, I don't want to find out my work was done in the power of the flesh. I'd like to hear him say, well done, thou good and faithful servant. That's what I'd like to hear. So I better be yielded to the Holy Spirit of God. I better make sure there's nothing between me and him. And I'd better make sure that I have more trust in him than I have in myself. I want you to bow your heads a moment. Your heads are bowed and your eyes are closed. And I want to ask you about your service for the Lord. I want to ask you about your Sunday school. I want to ask you about your singing. I want to ask you about the things you do for God. I want to ask you if you are yielded to the Holy Spirit. And if the things that you are doing, are you doing them in the power of of the Holy Spirit. That's what I'm asking you tonight. I don't want us to be dangerous. I don't want us to just be in the way. I want us to be used of God. But we'll have to be full of the Holy Ghost. Now let me ask you a question tonight. First of all, are you saved? Do you know for sure if you died, you'd go to heaven? Could you say tonight, preacher, I'm saved and I know it. I'm like Dan standing there 
when his father declared that he was part, and I, I've been, it's been declared by God in heaven because I've come and trusted Jesus as my Savior. I'm saved and I know it. Could you say that tonight? So, preacher, I know I'm saved even though, even though I was born a sinner and I, I haven't always done what I was supposed to do. I came to Jesus and trusted him as my Savior and he saved my soul. And I know that heaven is my home. Could you say that tonight? How many people tonight in the auditorium say, Preacher, I remember the time when I trusted Christ as my Savior. And I know if I were to die tonight, I'd go to be with the Lord because I've trusted Jesus. How many lift their hand as a testimony? The Bible said, let the redeemed of the Lord say so. If you've been redeemed, you ought not be ashamed to say so. I'm saved and I know it on my way to heaven. Thank you. You can put your hands down. Would there be somebody tonight say, Preacher, I'm not sure I'm saved, but I'd like to be. Would you pray for me? I'd like to pray for you. I won't call your name or come to you, but I'll pray. Pray for me, preacher. Anybody like that? You lift your hand and I'll see it and I'll pray for you. Wait in a moment. Now I'm asking you, Christian. You say, preacher, I'm saved and I know it. I'm asking you tonight. Are you operating in the power of the Holy Spirit? Yielded unto Him. Are you tonight? Are you? If you're not, why don't you come whatever it is Whatever it is between you, whether it's just you've been trusting your flesh or whether there's something in your heart that isn't what it's supposed to be and it's between you and the Holy Ghost, why don't you come do business with Him tonight and get it out of the way? Why don't you come and surrender and yield yourself unto Him tonight? Say, Lord, I want to walk in the Spirit and serve in the Spirit. I want to do what I do in the power of the Holy Spirit, the power of God, and not in my own strength. Why don't you come tonight get on an altar Get that thing right with God. Now, Father, you help us tonight. There are some folks amongst us who've not, they're not saved. They don't know if they died, they'd go to heaven. Their only hope is Jesus. And I pray they'll trust him tonight. And then, Lord, I pray for Christians tonight. We'll be yielded to the Holy Spirit of God in our lives. That the power, Lord, will be the power of God. Not by might nor by by power but by my spirit saith the Lord you help us with that will you tonight and we'll thank you for it and I pray in Jesus name and Lord I want to say thank you for using a wretch like me thank you Lord in Jesus name amen let's stand a moment we're standing our brother's going to lead us in a song what is it 308, 308. 308. I, surrender all. I surrender all why don't you come tonight God dealt with your heart the altar's open. It's always open around here. You come while we sing.